Hello, and welcome to the lore you know. This week may look a little different. Sarah is not with us. Instead, I have Chaz Calendar. Hello. Joining me as we talk about the creatures of Asherak. Uh, if you caught last week's episode, Asherak is a continent on the Scarred Lands planet called Skarn. Um, where am I going with this? What else did I need to talk about? Oh, coffee. Of course. I always forget coffee. Well, I don't forget my coffee. Because <laughs> I have that. Um, if you like coffee as much as I do, which I'm not sure is possible, but we can. I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. Head over to Found Familiar Coffee and use the code WHPUBS for 10% off. There's a link in the chat. And we're going to dive in. So, Chaz, you've played in the Scarlands with us. I have for two, almost three years now. Holy it's moly. It's crazy, right? Chaz is yeah. on uh, Travis Legg's show with me on Mondays where we play uh, a family affair set in yeah. Gelsbad. Right. Um, we haven't done any continent hopping yet. I guess we'll see how that goes in the future. We do have some quests that require us to uh, continent hop, as it were. Right. Saying hi to Alon in the chat. How's it going today, Alon? And we'll dive into the creatures. So we're going to jump around a little bit in the book. Uh, the cover of Strange Lands is on the screen now. And one of the creatures on there are, well, really the only creatures on there are the, uh, the glass scorpions. They are a, a creature unique to the Ashrak continent. Essentially what happened was... Let me double check I have the, the right Titan here. Okay, it just says Titanic blood. So during the Titans War, you know, the gods and their followers were fighting Titans and their Titan spawn. And tit Titanic blood was just spilled everywhere, as was Divine Essence, and we'll get into that later. But as a result of this, this Titanic blood has kind of like pooled under the surface of the, of the continent. And in these sandy areas where you might find scorpions anyway, so you could say maybe this happens because there are like, are scorpions, do scorpions lay eggs? I should have looked this up. I don't know. I think they do have like egg sacs. Yeah. That spiders do. So I'd assume you know, scorpions do as well. We're going to go with either baby scorpions or like, mm -hmm. or scorpion eggs or something um, float up from in these pools. And like when the pools kind of break through the surface, they, they like float up as these little like as they're tainted these little crystalline balls and then they hatch they like come up like come open and they're they're now these like crystalline forms of like these little scorpions they crawl up onto the sand and scurry away and over time they grow into what you see on your screen there um, these essentially kind of glass looking but really like crystalline, Mm -hmm. shaped or uh scorpion shaped crystalline entities right now what's fun about them is that they don't they weren't created on purpose and so they don't have like to a certain extent they're just like a beast right they, they don't have like a, a calling in their lives but they're driven to inject people with their poison for whatever reason, whether it's like a, a strange like madness in like uh -huh. about their creation or something. And so as a adventurer or maybe you're a part of a caravan, if you're like going across the desert up ahead, you see this like shining like reflection of sunlight or something. You might think, you, I mean, if you know about the scorpions, you might be like, oh, we got to watch out because there might be scorpions uh -huh. up there. But as you get closer, you realize these things aren't moving. There's like some kind of statues up ahead. And you might run into the remnants of another caravan or adventuring group where these people have been injected with the poison and their bodies have turned to essentially glass by the poison. So they're kind of like a Gorgon that turns you to stone, mm -hmm. but their sting turns you to glass. So I just thought it was a neat um, flavor for the continent instead of... And it's a, a beautiful flavor. I'm a big fan of these kind of like save or sucks and like not all the time but yeah. you know it, it has this like survival element where you're already in like the desert wilderness and so like you have certain amounts of like varying abilities to like maneuver there but you're like still trying to like, make it through and then 
oh no, we got stuck by the scorpion, we gotta turn back. No, it's too late to turn back. We have to keep going and Yeah, definitely. Um being prepared I feel like being prepared in Asherak is the way to survive anyway. Yeah. But like you don't just wanna go off in a caravan and not have someone that can like deal with poisons, deal with curses. Yeah. Uh, deal with dehydration, and we'll get into a lot of that because there's a lot of crap that will kill you in Asherak. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably why a lot of people, except for the Ubuntu, which are like the uh, the halflings of the desert right. here, a lot of people don't live in the desert. They live in those like small um, coastal regions that have water and plant life and stuff like that. But there are caravans that go through the desert, and there are hapless adventurers who will always go out and endanger themselves yes tune in on mondays for a family affair a nice example of that yeah (laughs) so i guess we will move on to the cactus imps now i guess i should point out how many there there are a lot of entries in the the strangelands books for the asherak creatures and a lot of them are fey celestial or fiends um a lot of things that were essentially came from elsewhere they were outsiders and we talked last week about that about how celestials and fiends and creatures that uh in 5e they they lost the outsider tag Mm -hmm. like it's not a you're either a celestial or a fiend essentially um you could be an aberration so like some of the uh former outsiders are now aberrations Um, gotcha but, like, you know, seeing these creatures is not a weird thing on Ashrak. Like, people aren't like, oh, let's go high-five that demon or something. But seeing one is not, like, cause for, um, how did this demon get here? It's, like, it's just we... that kind of place. Yeah. Um, it's, the, it's the land where the Titans first essentially pulled the existence of Skarn into being. Um, it's sages wonder whether Mount Numul was in existence when the Titans came to be. And like, that's where they pulled reality from, or if that's just the first place that reality sprang from, or this, this reality. Um, and so it's just like the gods were created here. Uh, so much of like what the Titans started off experimenting with started here and then we'll actually talk a little bit about that too because there's some contradiction um when it comes to rack dragons in this book but we'll get to that in a second so cactus imps are fey creatures um they don't really know where they came from but a lot of the fey were created by uh denev now whether or not she created these who knows right Um, they're essentially very small impish looking creatures that are colored like a cactus. And that might be, you know, greens or whatever, or it might be like rosy browns, depending Mm -hmm. on the the cactus in question. And they kind of like a dryad, they like live in a cactus, but they aren't tied to the cactus. If somebody destroys their cactus, they're like, you killed my home. I'm going to move that one over there. How dare you? (laughs) Yeah. How dare you? (laughs) And then they run away. And I think my favorite part of them is not that they're, because they're not really combatants. They're these tiny little guys, and if you try and hit them, they have spines, and so, like, you hurt yourself whenever you hit them, and it poisons right. you. But they're really just there to, tr- to trick you, to... Which is what you. Faye, like, should be. Exactly. Like, Faye should be like, hi, I'm going to help you, but I'm also going to, like, play tricks on you, because that's fun. And, like, maybe I won't help you this time. I don't know, but, like, I'm going to have fun. If you want to have fun, too, that's on you. Like, I can't control you. Right. And with these cactus imps, it's, uh, for me, they would be, as a DM, I'm, I would use them, like, when an adventuring party went and they were having a camp in the desert or if they were protecting a caravan or traveling on a caravan or something, um, these guys would come in and try to be unseen. So it might be at night. It might just be when mm-hmm. the caravan's resting. And they might sneak in and they'll, like, dump over the water barrels and maybe carry your sword off into the desert and bury it, that kind of thing. So they're really tricksters. They're there for, to me, they're really like a, a 
not plot device, but like a plot um, distraction. Right. So uh, like for just, like a little bit of hindrance or complication. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, but yeah, I think they're adorable. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to. Uh, we'll go ahead and go to the daemons. So daemons are. Let me find the art real quick so I can bring this first guy up. Demons are a different category of fiend. Um, in 5th edition, regular D&D, we have demons, which are chaotic evil. We have devils, which are lawful evil. Uh-huh. And then you have the Yugoloths, who myth- fit that like neutral evil right. fiend thing. Um as a DM, there's no reason you couldn't use Yugoloths in the Scarred, like the Scarred Land setting. Um, they may not necessarily make as much sense, especially if they have specific ties to Forgotten Realms or whatever. Right. Um, but that's where the D- the Daemons fill in that that's, that section there. Um, some were created by Vangel. Some were created by Belsimuth. Actually, quite a few were created by Belsimuth. Um, which is... I think is interesting because they're lo- or they're neutral evil and I don't want to say that Belsmith is chaotic evil, but I mean she is like the the patron of murderers and assassins. So it's like, is that is that chaotic? Like if it's an assassin, they're doing it for 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 pay. So it's almost like a lawful thing. You know what I, I think mean? Assassination is like a, a, a lawful evil type thing. Right. Because like following the rules, like, okay, I need you to assassinate this person in the Chuck E. Cheese. And you're like, all right, that's the rules I'm following for the kill. Like, it is evil, but also that, like, lawful thing. Yeah, but, I mean, if they're eating a Chuck E. Cheese, you kind of want, you hope that they, they succeed before, like, that food hits their stomach, so. Yeah, it's actually doing them a favor. Might be right, good. right. <laughs> So this specific daemon is called a beguiling merchant. I absolutely love these guys. Um, again, they are not meant to be combat right. mobs. Like they're they're not there to like be thrown into fighting and all that. They are. Uh, you're walking through the market and you're looking for a magic sword. Mm-hmm. And so you're looking through the stalls and this guy comes out and he's like, what are you looking for? And you're like, oh, I'm looking for a magic sword. Oh, I just happen to have one. And you're looking over his stuff and maybe it doesn't look like he's really selling all that many things. But then like with a sleight of hand, he just pulls out the most magnificent looking sword you've ever seen. And he begins discussing payment with you. And over the haggling, it becomes clear that like he's willing to part with this without you having to give him money if you're just willing to go and, you know, commit this act of arson or go over and kill this person. Or maybe if you just want to give him your soul after you die, you get to keep it until then. Uh He can throw in a little extra on top of this magic sword. And so it's like these guys are, um, I feel they're almost like the night hags of the daemon because they're they're all about collecting the souls for whoever they work for and uh they can actually create magic items using your soul so if you're willing to give him your soul or her Mm -hmm. they will pluck a small piece of that out during a like a 10 minute ritual and forge it into a specific magic item and it's it's crazy. So essentially, they can replicate any ninth level spell, or right. any spell as a ninth level spell. So if you mm-hmm. want it, if you want an object that does cure wounds, then for six times per day, you can use this object to do cure wounds at ninth level. Yes. At, and you don't even need to be like a player character. You can be a farmer, or and just like, has an item. Right. And so I think it's like this amazing um, plot point device where some desperate person went and sold their soul for this like incredibly powerful artifact that yeah. only they can use, by the way, because it disappears it's when they die. Now. Right. And if you destroy the object, that person dies and they can't be, if they've done this, they have given their soul to this beguiling merchant. Mm-hmm. They don't get to come back. 
they can't be resurrected they can't be reincarnated um and if you do the other stuff where you're like yeah i'll go set that guy's house on fire for this sword or whatever um immediately after you make the agreement you're under a a gaius to to do that you can't not right. do it and you don't get a save against it because you are willingly saying you've agreed to the terms right so these guys are great plot point devices um I, so i'm a big fan of fiends in general yeah. um you you've seen mad maggie um <laughs> right but I, I also love like like you know rock shasta specifically like the fiends that are not you know, I'm going to fight. I mean, I love Zariel. She's one of my favorites. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. But I love the one that's just like, yeah, no, like, I'm here to steal your soul. Like, you know this. I know this. But, like, I can give you stuff. Like, let's work together because there's always that point as the DM where you can, like, pique the player's interest. You're like, you can do that? Of course I can. Right. What's the worst that could happen? You're dead. You don't need your soul. And especially when you're, like, if that fiend or whatever presence is willing to wait, which most of them are Yeah, like they may have quotas, but they have a long lifespan over to which, to, over which to fill that quota. Yeah. It's not like Monday. It's, you know, right. Before the next thundering. Right. <laughs> so, I mean, they have time, they can hang out and they're just like, when you think you need it, you call me and they're going to be yeah. like, no, I'm never going to need it. And then they get into that battle where everything is so pitched and, going against them and they're just like shit yeah uh, and they take out that sending stone or whatever in they just call yeah. out the name and that's how i got ross to do the book of evil book of vile yep. darkness yep I was and like, it worked. Yeah, i'll just leave this to you at some point you're gonna use it and she was like no and yeah, she was like it. one of the best like goodest characters that were that were in that game and, so yeah and like anyone can be corrupted given the right opportunity and uh yeah right, right opportunity <laughs> all right so let's move on to the eye thief also a daemon these guys don't necessarily have like a uh a job when it comes to the hierarchy they're not there to like get souls or whatever um and they don't ha have eyes of their own. Uh, generally speaking, they can pass for elderly folk. Mm -hmm. um, as long as their hands aren't seen, because their hands are like these twisted, massive talons and claws. And so they tend to wear these like long robes and cover them up. And they have these, you know, uh, strips of cloth to cover their, their lack of eyes. So they can act as beggars um, and, and lure people in. And then as they come in, you know, the, the eye thief tries to grab them and essentially their their mouth opens and this like tongue proboscis thing comes out and latches on to their prey's eyeball and rips it out of their head, which I find absolutely fantastic. It's such a like, what the fuck just happened moment. And then it like... In my head, because it doesn't really say how it does it, in my head it ends up, like, going back into their mouth, and then the proboscis probably, like, pops it back up where the eye socket, like, is. And then the eye thief can use those eyes for uh, 1d4 weeks, I think. Okay. Uh, until it, essentially until it rots away. Right. And what's awesome is, like, if you have a gaze attack, so if it's a, a, a beholder or... Um, is it, it Medusa? Gets, Medusa? Is it a gaze or just like a... I think it is a gaze. In I think it is a gaze. So yeah, like, they can use those those different abilities. Interesting. So like walking into a room and watching this old man grappling in a beholder <laughs> and they're like, Aah. right? And then he eats one of his eyes. It'd be great. Or, or if if you as a DM set one of these guys to be Oh, I'm here to help you. And then, like, death right eye. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so they're fun. They're, um... Yeah. I guess they're not my favorite of the of the outsiders, but they're, they're up there. They're fun. Yeah. They're very, uh, situational, I guess. Right. All right. 
Dark Moon Slayer. Yes. So Chaz is a huge fan of Belsimuth. I am. Belsimuth is fun. She has all the cool things. She does all, all the, the cool things. Toys. We were talking about this before the thing, because the bad guys have all the fun toys. Yeah. And the good guys like, are like, here's my fairy that heals things. Yeah, good guy. I cast Healing Word on you. Bad guy. I summon a void from the Hadar Celestial Sphere that you cannot see, and there are just things happening, and if you go in, like, things will grab you and, like, lick you, and you're like, what that? What level spell is that? Nine? Right. No, that's three. Like, I can do this, what? like, two days. <laughs> right? Like, there's a difference. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so in in relation to Belsimith, um or or sorry, in in concerning Belsimith, um yeah. she's one of the gods. She is the twin sister of Madriel. And so um go back and, and watch the, the gods video. We'll we break it down a lot more as far as their purposes, but I find it entertaining that Belsimith likes to sneak in and gain worship from Madriel's followers. And so she does these little things and like she she's created these angelic looking beings called Dark Moon Slayers. And essentially they they come down literally from the moon because that is Belsimith's domain, but they they're semi-transparent they fall down from the sky and they perch next to a sleeping person and they like caress their brow and instill horrible gut-wrenching nightmares upon them <laughs> now it is absolutely possible that these nightmares can attack or can kill these subjects uh -huh. um if they don't then you know they they survive, they survive they had really terrible nightmares um so i'm just making sure i didn't miss anything so yeah they um they're they're kind of a a, a conundrum because if someone awake saw them they might think madriel sent this angelic being right to help them or to, you know, do whatever, um, for this person who's sleeping and they may, may not do anything because of that. They may not like jump up and be like, get away from them. Cause if you, especially if you're a Madriolite, you might like stop and like worship for a second while this dark moon slayer is killing your friend. Yeah. Who knows? The, the, the trickery is so fun. Um, <laughs> and while the actual, like the mechanics of the creature is, you know, it's it's, it's less. It's that like story that you can craft as right. a DM. Like someone is having horrible dreams, and then like you wake up, roll me a religion check. Oh, you only rolled a fifteen. Oh, Matriel is helping your friend. Ah, oh, yes, praise Matriel. And Bustman's just like, he, 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 he. <laughs> right? So that's what I assume she sounds like. Just, he, 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 he. it's just what. <laughs> Does she do the? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think she has like. Like five different laughs she like cycles through. That's completely fair. Yeah. I think over time she would have just been like, okay, this laugh is enough. I need a new one. Yeah. Like I've done this one for enough time. Uh, let's go to another one now. Okay. So that brings us to uh -huh. some demons going back to the fiend side of things. The chaotic evil. The Bellowing Demon. These guys are kind of fun. Um, so they were created by Vangel. Really, actually, it says they're the vanguard of Vangel's demonic armies. Um, I feel like it it alludes to the fact that they were created by Vangel because he did create so many of the demons. Right. Is it possible they existed before he started, Before maybe before he even did? Sure, and he just sub subjugated them. Mm -hmm. um, sure. Sure. They now work for Vangel. Right. Um, They're the vanguard of his army. They fly at the forefront of his legion, scattering the uh, army and render... Scattering the enemy and rendering them deaf to their own commanders. So, as you can see from the art, these things are flying... Horrible-looking abominations. Uh, they're kind of like a mix between a demon and a gibbering mouther. Yeah. 
where they have like multiple mouths, multiple eyes. They can see, so there's more eyes on the back of that thing's head. It doesn't really show that very well, but um, they can't be surprised. They don't, you know, they have, essentially they have the alert feet in 5e. Right. Um, but their mouths do have different effects, and those effects are in third edition, they were called free actions. They could just do it on their turn, and it could be an ongoing thing. Um, there isn't, I mean, they, you can kind of do stuff like that in fifth edition, but there's not, it doesn't have an activation cost. Right. Um, essentially, it's, uh, I guess you could work it into a multi attack. So uh, it does this and uses this scream, and it uh-huh. can sustain, sustain the screams. Um, It kind of is indefinite, but after a certain, um, like a certain time, they uh, for every found five rounds in which it uses it, it has to do a it it loses a con point. So essentially, it's like taxing itself. Right. So even though it's like it it doesn't have a limit, it it kind of does. It's like a soft um, limit, yeah. right? Um, it doesn't kill it if it's if it's con it hits zero, mm-hmm. um, as opposed to like when you take con damage, if you hit zero, you die. Yeah, and I think this thing would pretty much just be like, okay, huh, I'm a little oh. parched. I got to go get some water. Yeah. Toss <laughs> some sucrets in there get some throat <laughs> spray. Um, but yeah, it has like multiple different things. One of them is a thundering bellow, which does sonic damage and then causes the deafness condition, um, which is great for things like healing word um, yes. things that you like keeping each other from being like, Hey, I'm going over here to do this. Like, um, scatters the armies from really being able to it's communicate. Right. Yeah. Uh, what's also interesting is inanimate objects within the range take damage. Um, in five E that the ruling on that is a little different, mm-hmm. but essentially, uh, in third edition things had a hardness rating and they were dropped by five for every round that they were in it. Mm-hmm. Uh, the next ability you can do is the howl of summoning. Um, most fiends, you know, they get to summon other demons or whatever. This one's right. really kind of crazy. Any evil, sorry, any chaotic evil creature within one mile has to do a will save. So that would be a wisdom or a charisma save, depending on the, right. um, so I, I did do a conversion of this, and I did wisdom as the save. Uh, if they fail, they have to come to the demon as quickly as possible. So this isn't even just other demons; these are people. These are you know any right. chaotic evil creature has to come yeah. to this call. Mm-hmm. Um, it enrages the summoned creatures, so they have to attack without reservation. It's a compulsion or mind affecting effect, as well as a sonic one. So if somebody is deafened, they can't hear it. Right. It doesn't. It doesn't affect them. Um, now, what these rules don't clarify is whether or not the creature that is attacking, like the, the creature under the effect, can choose what it attacks, or if it's just essentially doing like that kind of berserker attacking the closest thing kind of right. thing. Like, does it attack the demon when it gets there? Or can the or demon be like, like, go attack that thing? And it like has enough control over Spirits of Creation to be like, okay, froth that way. Right, right. Um, this is one that I, I really, really enjoy because it's not a spell casting. Oh no, sorry. It does have spell like abilities, but um, I really enjoy it when designers give creatures a counter spell of some kind mm-hmm. especially when they're not like if it's not the counter spell spell which is a counter spell like ability right and so one of its whales is a high pitched keening that acts as the counter spell um right. against all arcane so it doesn't do like uh, druid magic so it doesn't do clerics paladins they're right. all fine um so i thought that was pretty interesting and then it can do a wall of sound. Uh, so the sound that it emits creates an invisible spherical dome 
uh, 100 feet in radius and it keeps uh-huh. uh, in that edition there was a spell called song wall I should have looked that one up because I can't remember exactly what it does but uh, essentially the the wall of cacophony a version of the spell would create a wall that was like difficult to pass through like a wall I think of you, forest right thing. right yeah. And then otherwise, you know, the the creature, this demon gets like some pretty nasty spells. It has disintegrate. Nice. It has uh, some of the older power words like thunder, Mm -hmm. um, but it does have power word kill. Word of chaos. Yeah. There's a lot of older stuff on here. Greater command, greater teleport. Yeah. Plane shift. I think they're they're fun guys. Yeah, it's been a nice like end of arc battle. Yeah. I guess it depends on what your arc was. But if uh, if those your... are if those are your starting off creatures, you're you might be in a world of hurt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so don't let Travis have the stats to that because we'll be fighting them next week. I mean, womp womp. you should find at least three. That's right. Right. You're, that's fair. Yeah. At least three at once. And they all have haste on them, like a permanent haste from a wish spell on them constantly. Absolutely. Just like belt of that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll move on to another demon. Um, this is the Oculus demon. I don't want to say I'm disappointed in this creature, but it's one of my least favorite from this collection essentially they are um fallen succubus or incubus um that have for whatever reason in the hierarchy displeased someone above them and so their forms and powers have been stripped from them and they they essentially exist as an invisible entity that flits around and i feel like they're trying to gain that that favor back so they can be given their forms again Right. Um, Because they kind of have a shitty existence compared to being like the super sexy seductor. Right. I'm going to go and take your soul and kiss you. But do the same thing at the same time. So this one. uh, Oh, go ahead. This reminds me very much of. I'll say dragons. And that, like, I personally don't like dragons mechanically. Mm -hmm. Um, It's like I find them. Like, very boring, you know, ancient dragon does fire damage and, like, bites and claws and it's scary. And, like, that's that, that's it. And so, like, the only way I can, like, make use of dragons is like, through, like, the narrative. So it's not right. just the mechanics of, oh, we're finding this big bob, but, like, oh, this dragon has, like, taken it over. And I think that's, if, if I were to use this, that's, like, how I would have to use it. It wouldn't just be, like, a character you fight one, or, like, fight one time or come in contact with one time. It would have to be, like, you come to this town and right. uh, it's, like, a an end boss it won't be a, like a fight an end boss to this like entire arc of like a, a super early one to figuring out like what's going on like let's do some investigation yeah um, other than that like like you said like it's a disappointing just kind of shitty incubus yeah so, yeah incubus. and they uh I, I do agree it's a great story arc so like you come to town and they're like oh these people are just you know randomly dying or whatever yeah. um and the only way to notice them is to happen to notice their glowing, their slightly glowing eyes in a mirror. You can't right. just see their their any for, part of their form normally, but you might catch a glimpse of them out of a mirror to know that they're somewhere around. Something, yeah. So that's really entertaining. Um, there was a part of it that I found a little confusing. So this is the Oculus uses this ability to discover what delights a potential victim, what delights a potential victim, and then take such form take a such a form as something cute and innocent, such as a lovable dancing dancing pig or a cute talking bunny. Um, adults ra- rarely witness the creature, so it says that it appears as a uh, like a lot of the times people may get a like a, an idea that these things are around because there's like this plague among the children of the city so i feel like 
even though, and maybe I just missed it, but I don't see anything in here that says kids can see this. Right. But I do love that idea. Like, it doesn't really have a form and it follows these kids around. And then like, once it realizes, okay, so this little girl likes bunnies and chocolate. And right. so I'll turn into like a little stuffed Shock bunny. bunny yeah. <laughs> I don't know if they turn into a chocolate bunny and they get eaten by the kid, but well, you gotta, like, that would be a great away. twist. And then the kid's like, I want you chocolate bunny. And then you're like, I'm going to see your soul. Right. So if I were, if I were DMing that, that's totally how I would do it, where kids can see the forms that this thing right, projects like to, to them. Right. So I think that's the my favorite part about that creature. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to skip the next guy because he's going to become the focus of our other topic. So we're going to go to some devils. Now also this guy is the devil version on Skarn of the Arcanoloth on Faerun, essentially. So the Arcanoloth is a Yugoloth that essentially is like, I'm the librarian, I get lore, I keep it. If people want lore, they come to me for it. These guys are like the lore keepers for the Devil Kingdoms, essentially. Right. Um, they... They're not as powerful as most devils, but they are considered indispensable in the infernal hierarchy because, you know, if uh, a devil is about to go on some kind of war path against something else, they want to, you know, have knowledge about what they're fighting. And so they'll go to the academians and see what lore that they've collected about them. Um, there's some rivalries, like they're not, huge on the uh which ones did it say sorry i don't remember off the top of my head and i don't want to look for it too long uh there there's like a couple of the devils where they're just like you're uncouth like right. <laughs> don't touch my books <laughs> but other than that they you know that's that's what their existence is is like collecting this lore and having it for whoever shows up for it right. um I feel like, you know, in the in the devil hierarchy, they uh, they probably don't have much say in in the revealing of information. Right. Especially like to they're... like higher power devils. Mm -hmm. But great plot point for a group to be sent like to need information. And like know that this devil right. has it. And then what because this devil doesn't have to give it to them. Right. So what, what What does the devil need? And what is the group willing to give to get this information to... Right. Get this demon or blah, 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 blah. Absolutely. That'd be fine, yeah. And these next devils, I find really entertaining. Um, these guys are are called Diabolic Enforcers, and even though they're called Diabolic, they are also the enforcers of packs between... Well, not even packs, but, like, um, uh, if you are a cleric or a paladin of really any god, because it, mm -hmm. it doesn't specifically say um, that normal, like, uh, a neutral or a good god can't use these. Right. But they may not choose to just but essentially like if if they broke their devotion their you know like a black guard is essentially a fallen paladin right black guy guard might find himself haunted by one of these metal band and wrapped like enshrouded mm -hmm. things that just ooze blood and gore with these huge like ragged bat wings um they'll come looking for you and I can absolutely see warlocks that have broken their packs with their patrons being hunted down by these guys. I think, yeah. I like and, that. Yeah. And depending on the, you know, like the, anyone who's done a pact to the fiend or, you know, mm -hmm. like that's their, uh, whether or not it's a devil or a demon or a, a daemon or whatever. Um, right. I could absolutely see them being like, yeah, 
to send the di- the diabolic enforcer after him. Yeah. But Belsimuth, I could also see her doing that. Um, I could see Hadrada doing that. He's uh-huh. like, just because like Hadrada has this like weird um, thing with the law, you know, like the law is the law. And so yeah. even though he's not a, an evil God, I could see him sending these after a person who's broken an oath to him. If you did not want this to happen, you should have followed the law. It was clearly spelled out for you. Right. You read the contract. You yeah, signed like- it. Therefore, you have to deal with the consequences. And I, so this is one of those creatures that's also kind of extraordinarily twisted. It happens sometimes in the Scarred Lands. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, it always knows where the, the offender is. But what's more, they know where all of the loved ones okay, and loved things, one, yeah. yeah, where all sure. of the things that are important to that person are. Yeah. So let's say you're a, a farmer. Mm-hmm. Your crop is dying. Like there hasn't been rain. And so you make some agreement with whatever force that is. Maybe it's a demon. Maybe it's a devil. Maybe it's a god, mm-hmm. a demigod, whatever. And that god gives you whatever it is that you need and your crops grow. And when it comes time to pay the price for whatever it gave you, you don't do it for whatever reason. You just think you can get away with it. I've already got my crops. I don't need it. Right. So they send a di- diabolic enforcer after you, but they don't come after you. And one mm-hmm. day you come home and your daughter is dead and your wife is dead and your son that went off to college, you get awesome. news that he's dead. Yeah. I mean like, and this is such a great plot point for, um, you know, characters in general that have gone against something because then it's in, then, you know, as part of your adventure, it is up to your party or at least that character, if the party doesn't want to be involved to, you know, try and stay ahead of this demon, sorry, this devil in right. order to save their family or whatever. It has a lot of great plot device concepts. Like yeah. And they're horrid looking. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. So the next creature is we won't talk about it too much. They're just cute. The dire camel. The dire camel. So that is the camel and if you notice the very small person next to him is probably an Ubuntu which is a halfling. So a normal size like a, a human sized person would probably go up maybe to the thing's belly at, at tallest. Right. Probably not even that tall. Some of the taller races might, but right. uh, humans would probably, you know, be the the height of one of these things' legs. Um, Ubuntu use these as like war animals, so they'll like if you've seen the last Lord of the Rings movies with the the Oliphants and how they're like riding the Oliphants into war, and they have the big um, oh I cannot think of the word like the little leather hut that sits on top yes. and um you know they put these on those on the backs of these things it's it's a large camel yeah <laughs> fun for a party to have yeah uh the divine envoy here um appears as though it were like created from clay like a fired clay and they have these like i think pearlescent eyes that are other otherwise featureless and they have these like large I almost want to call them dragonfly wings. That's what I was thinking, yeah. And they have these sigils on them. And I feel like the sigils, it doesn't really say what they do, but I almost feel like they're they could potentially be like warding mm-hmm. against tampering. Because essentially these wings things were created after the Divine War by the gods who had uh, in, in they entered the divine pact where they weren't going to step foot upon the world again. They weren't going to mess with each other directly, but yet they also found that their messengers were causing problems. So like a messenger in Keeley might just for shits and grins, change the message she's passing along. Mm-hmm. Um,
like how it says Vangel had no servants civilized enough to be trusted with anything but violence. Um, people might not be able to speak diplomatically with Belsimith's demons, uh, demons. Right. So like these, these like creatures that already existed that they trusted to send messages were not like necessarily the best creatures to send off. So the gods came together and created these divine and envoys. Um, they're large. So like imagine a golem mm-hmm. uh, made of clay and I feel like maybe those those sigils are like keep you from tampering with it, so you can't change its message or something like that. That's just as a DM, that's just what I would throw in there. Um, but yeah, they're essentially just used as as messenger creations. Mm-hmm. They're kind of neat. Um, yeah. They're like one of those creatures you would rarely ever see. Right. Very plot point device you know plot device all right so here's where a conundrum sets in let me find the art here there you are so this beautiful creature is a dust rack dragon now if you caught the episodes on dragons way back at the beginning of lore you know uh, you know that uh, rack dragons are not real dragons. They look like dragons, and they actually they have the the dragon subtype, mm-hmm. but they are not true dragons in the way right. that like the dragons on the Serpent Isles are true mm-hmm. dragons. Um, a lot of the lore states that the rack dragons were created during the Divine War to be used essentially as as siege weaponry and as like massive tools of destruction against the, the enemy. Um, a lot of them were created by the Titans. So example, for example, the dust rack dragons here were created by Mesos himself. Um, and Mesos's death is what really set the divine war rolling. Uh-huh. And it talks here about how before the Titan Titans war, the Dustrak dragons were plentiful on Asherak. So these things had already existed. Right. Now, whether that's because... And so, like, that might be because... Like, the, the creation of the other rack dragons might have been based on these. Like, like, Mesos might have created these first, right? And then they use the basis of that to be like, okay, well, these things fuck shit up, so let's build some of these. Like more of those. Let's make a water right. one. Like, let's... Exactly. So it doesn't really clarify like what the, where that like lineate that um that that break is like why, why were these in existence first, but. Um, it essentially says that, then the divine war happened. The father of sorcery was betrayed. He was uh ripped into a a irreparable essence. Like it was just spread out across the world and it drove the dust rack dragons crazy. They just went berserk. It's interesting because they went berserk, but they didn't like go berserk and just start destroying everything around them. They started hunting each other. Right. And destroying each other, which is really um, lore wise. I found that fascinating because it was like, everyone was already killing everyone else and during was... the divine war. <laughs> so for these guys to just be like tearing each other apart was, was interesting. Um, there's a little bit of how long did it take them to do this? It's not really clear because Did the Seraphic engine explode before or after Mesos was destroyed? Because mm-hmm. essentially it says on here that Mesos was destroyed, the, the dust racks went crazy, killed each other, and then as they finished slaughtering each other, the last one standing um, witnessed the destruction of the Seraphic engine. So there's some like weird incongruous time stuff going on there um, because 
I've read other things that says Mesos died after the Seraphic Engine. Mm-hmm. But whatever is the case, um, the the detonation of the engine actually made... So the Dust Rack Dragon that survived had actually drawn power from the destruction of the other ones. It was kind of like, if you've ever seen Highlander, it's mm-hmm. like they went full-on Highlander against each other. And in the right. end, there could be only one. And there was. And yeah. he was super powerful because of it. And then the engine blew up. And for whatever reason, it didn't blow him up in the process. It made him immortal. It gave him uh-huh. more power. Um, and so now he's kind of chill. <laughs> and he, he's not like, now that the, the right now that the rage is gone. Um, he's grown, it says, curiously nonviolent towards most lesser beings. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's kind of put himself in this position of, like, lore keeper of the continent of Asherak. So you have this, like, ultimately powerful pseudo-dragon. Right. That could easily rival... Okay, so it says challenge rating 18 on here. Um, he's going to easily rival a lot of the true dragons. But not all of them, because obviously, like, there are elder dragons, you know, ancients that are getting into CR twenty and above. Right. Um. I think. Do you have anything to throw in on this guy? Not really. I mean, as as a rag dragon. Once again, like I see all dragons are just like story, and this is a nice, fun kind of. I see him as, as a kind of like a sphinx, you know, mm-hmm. like super powerful, just kind of hanging out in the desert, like knows all the things. Uh, curiously peaceful to lesser beings means he's probably kind of like playful or sees them as like, ah, oh, you're trying to learn. Good for you. <laughs> Here's my ABC for dummies book, and you're like, no, rag. Yeah, you think you're a pe- kind of that kind of you know super arrogant like essentially a dragon in all things but name right on story point uh comment from chat and i know you're gonna love this he'd make a great warlock patron yeah. <laughs> 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 and I, I find it even more than like other dragons he absolutely would because he is something beyond what a dragon is not because he's a dust rack or like a rack dragon in general but because he is infused with He's like energies from the seraphic engine. Right. <laughs> That's fucking brilliant. Sorry. That is brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Um, that is not what we could, we're going to talk about for uh, warlock patrons, but that might have to be a thing in the future. Yeah. Okay. So we'll move on to the dream thief. Dream thieves are interesting because they appear like these vulture, like just beasts that sit in the desert. But they're actually djinn. Um, they are lesser djinn that go in the guise of ra- large ravens when they are... Sorry, I was I said vulture earlier. Uh, large ravens when they're on the material plane. Um, so kind of like that creature earlier, the, 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 dark the Belsimite. Yeah, the Dark Moon... Uh, on envoy yeah something like that something like that um these guys will like come down and cause nightmares on sleeping creatures so whether a humanoid or whatever um but they come down they land and essentially they cause nightmares and then feed off that energy so they don't yeah. eat carrion they don't eat you know meat and all that they're that um, like fear yeah yeah so yeah they're essentially fear eaters yeah absolutely um, they're they're a neat thing to throw at your adventures while they're you know traveling through the desert. Yeah, people treat rest as like an easy time. You know, you have you know you do your rotations like I do for a swashy roll, and then like right. usually it's like they are prepared for that. They're not prepared for things like this, where it's like, oh, that's a bird. Mm-hmm. I don't care about that. Uh, Chaz doesn't wake up because he had a nightmare that killed him. What? Oh no! (laughs) Right. (laughs) 
yeah, for it to, you're, you're absolutely right. Like, um, adventurers are waiting and, you know, like it really depends on the DM because if, if your DMing style is to not point out things unless it's a combat during a rest, right. Then your players are going to absolutely be like, this is a bad thing. If you're like, yeah, and there's a crow sitting over there. Right. And they're going to either chase it off or shoot it or whatever. Right. But if like, you yeah. build up your storytelling and you're like, so during the night you hear, you know, coyotes in the distance singing and like some, something goes scampering by in the dark. Mm -hmm. Then when you drop something like this, you know, oh, a, a small group of birds lands on a rock over there. Like, yeah, that's that happens there are birds i know that as a person right uh, or you could be like the dm who just like says random things you know like one of my favorite tricks to do is roll a d20 why oh, yes just do it but if like if you do that you know that like it always doesn't matter then like roll a d20 oh you see a bird is that why i roll a d20 how dare you yeah like right. there are lots of ways to just have a bird come in fly under the radar which is like what they would do they fly under the radar as you know, little ravens. Yeah. I think that, wow. that technique is a great way of instilling tension in a, in a mechanical way. Yeah. Um, because, you know, a lot of players, and I feel like especially in 5th edition, I could be wrong, but a lot of players are re very mechanically focused. Uh, a lot of players enjoy the story and they really like the lore and stuff like that, but like, they really like, this is my character power and this is what I can do. And so when you do something that involves dice, when you make them roll something, but don't tell them why. Right. They're like, what's going on? A thing. What does it, what does it mean? It yeah. means a thing. Yeah. Something happened. You'll find out. Something. Yeah. Like it'll happen for sure. Uh, during the, when I was running adventures league during the Ravenloft stuff, I did just random wisdom saves. Yeah. So yeah. Great technique. Love it. Uh, the next creature on here, um, I, it's definitely taken, I feel like it's inspired by a certain other creature. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to name what that creature is. And I do wish it was called a drowning pool. Because then it's where the bodies hit the floor. <laughs> but this is a drowning hole, which are uh, found in the deserts of Asherak. And essentially what you see in the image, which looks like a pool with some you know, like kind of palm tree looking things coming up and some grasses is actually just the the mouth of a creature submerged below it. Uh -huh. So much like the <laughs> Sarlacc pit <clears throat> on <laughs> a, a certain movie, um, ah. what you see is the like the lesser side of things. Like you're not seeing the entirety of the creature, which is massive and goes far below the, the surface of the ground. The palm trees are actually tentacles. Mm -hmm. that have like these fronds on the top that kind of help it like detect things. And then those grasses are like, you know, um, uh, like almost like fur. Right. Uh, to also to help it sense things. And the pool is its saliva that's just like built up. And that saliva is both poisonous and acidic. And so one, if you go up and you start drinking it, you're melting your insides to begin right. with. And, if the creature can throw you into the pool and you begin dissolving, then it, you know, gains nutrients from that. It can uh -huh. dissolve metal. It can dissolve stone. It takes longer, but like a body essentially dissolves. Through, yeah. yeah. A, a body dissolves within 24 hours. Swords and such can take a few weeks. Right. Uh, definitely faster than the Sarlacc pit. <laughs> you don't spend eternity being <laughs> died slowly Just, digested. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Um, I, I really do like these creatures, especially in Asherak because they are one of, they're, they're gonna, they're a trap. Yeah. You, you have your characters who have run out of water. And they're like, uh, there's a pool. I gotta right. go. And they I'll just run up. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. They just, they just run up. You know that they're like, oh yeah, I just run over and start drinking the water. I have my horse drink it. You know, you know the camel, yeah. the dire camel starts drinking it. Um, although, you know, a DM might be like, oh, the horse shies away from it. Right. You know, because horses tend to like be like, that oh, like, doesn't smell yeah. right. I don't know what that is, but. Right. 
Yeah. So, I mean, they're not, I don't want to say they're the most unique of designs, but the, the drowning hole is pretty in, entertaining. Yeah. Next is the fossil ghoul. These guys are pretty, I don't want to say they're pretty generic, but they're pretty generic. Uh, yeah. They're, they're ghouls. They can also, you know, they give you ghoul fever just like a ghoul does. If you die of it, you turn into a ghoul. Mm -hmm. Essentially, their big thing is they they eat fossilized stuff. They can actually, like, digest rock and sand. Like, uh, um, it says that they, like, they burrow into the ground and they, like, eat sand and, and soft earth and everything. And then they just, like, poop out really dense scat. Right. as they do it um so they've created like all of these like wormholes through the underneath of asherak other than that they're pretty pretty straightforward they've been around for a long long time looking at the picture i am reminded of the abandoned which are the first intelligent race that was created on on skarn um mm -hmm. If an abandoned turned into a ghoul, I can kind of see it looking like this. Uh, right. They were kind of, they kind of looked like Sasquatch, not quite as hairy, um, or like really big bipedal apes that like didn't. Um, I can't think of what it's called. Uh, knuckle walking, the thing that like gorillas do. They they never. They're like really big gorillas that walk upright like a like a human. Gotcha. Um, I could I could see the the similarity like the the jaw. Mm -hmm. um, so is that because it doesn't really say what they where they came from? Um, they're a prehistoric breed of ghoul. So yeah. is it possible that these ghouls came from the Varen, uh, the abandoned? Absolutely. Is that where they came from? Not necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's pretty much them. They do have a chance of turning you either into a normal ghoul, a ghast, or a f another fossil ghoul. Right. We already talked about the glass scorpion. Um, we talked about the gorgata last week. I'm going to throw them up really quick here. Uh -huh. These are, uh, colossal back in the day, so they'd be gargantuan. Thanks so now, yeah. Yeah, in 5th edition. Um, magical tortoises. Uh, they roam the deserts when they die the ubuntu like live under their shells uh -huh. their shells like um their shells act as like water traps so like they're so big that like atmosphere will get caught inside yeah, and like yeah. drip down so they're they can create oases around them uh -huh. really that's they're that's they're non-violent yeah. if just you like try and what's that just like big tortoises yeah they're yeah. they're just big tortoises so that will bring us to the Kelk Kelklik sand beetles. Um, I feel like these are the lice of the desert, but uh -huh. they are large. So right. imagine a louse that is larger than you that walks around and essentially what is it that they ate? There was something about them that I was just like, that's kind of messed up. I think they just kind of eat. Yep, there it is. Eats everything and anything in their path. Uh -huh. So civilizations, uh, like colonies and stuff that are not colonies, um, villages, towns, cities that are, either in the desert or set up at the, at the base or at the edges of the desert have actually built fortifications, not against these, but around these. So like if they mm -hmm. find a, a nest, they go and like fortify that area to keep them within that area. Right. And not let them out to destroy things beyond that. Um, that's really, <laughs> they're just kind of a, they're a desert creature. There's not a whole bunch to them. Mm -hmm. Then there's the King's Hound. These guys are also kind of interesting. Um, so they were originally uh, hounds that were part of, you know, the forests that were across the, the face of uh -huh. Asherak. 
and they were infused by do devotees of Hrynruk, the Titan, uh, to sniff down and to sniff out and run down heretical god worshippers. So essentially, yes. the Titans were using these to find those who were worshiping gods and taking, you know, because they wanted to keep the gods from gaining power. Mm -hmm. um, so the the hound can sniff magic. Right. And it can differentiate between divine and arcane magic, which ended up biting the Titans in the butt because once clerics learned of this, they would capture them and then retrain them to find to out. To then find the <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the people that are like, you know, druids and, and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. uh, both sides have these. They use them to hunt each other down. Um, they're a neat plot point or like plot yeah. device. We also talked about the Nahim last week a little bit. I'll run over, I'll go over their info just real quick. Um, there is a group of monks in. Oh crap! Sorry, one of the the mountain ranges. I cannot think of which one it is. I apologize. Excuse me. Uh, they're called the Exemplars, okay. and essentially the Exemplars are like this holy monastic order of uh, monks. The Nahim are people who were training to become those monks. And then as they were reaching that moment of enlightenment, they essentially floundered in their faith and they became cursed as undead. Right. Now that is some harsh shit to do to somebody who is like, so I, I don't see, you know, Madriel being like, okay, you've been this monk. You really, uh oh and you're you're kind of questioning things a little bit okay i'm not going to grant you power but you can move on with your life whereas like right. belsimuth vangel uh some of the dark gods that just kind of are assholes i can absolutely being see them being like oh well you failed me because you didn't quite live up to my expectation of what your faith should be yeah you were supposed to be here, here i'm dead <laughs> you were here so now you're undead <laughs> right so their existence is created, like as an undead, is created by their question of faith. Um, I think right. that's just such a interesting because most undead are like, oh, I died in a horrible fire, so I come back as a fiery ghoul or uh -huh. something. You know, um, I have unfinished business. These are more like cursed, created undead. Yeah. Um, due to their lack of faith, build wise, their abilities, they are some crazy ass monks. <laughs> um, think about the like the powerful monk, high level monk stuff that you get as mm -hmm. as a character. That is what you get as this thing, but you're also undead. <laughs> Pretty entertaining. Okay, so we're gonna get to the other side of that dark moon. It wasn't envoy. I can't think of what. <laughs> the Panacea Spirit Slayer, Dark Moon Slayer. So yeah. Slayer. The, yeah. There it is. So, of course, Belsmith has a winged creature. Madriel also has to have a winged creature. Or maybe it's the other way around. Like, during the Divine War, Madriel had these, like, little... So these are, like, tiny... They'd be Celestials now. They're outsiders in this book. Um, and they are literally Lynx. Or, sorry. Yeah, Lynx. Fairy in a bottle. Like... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they flit around, they breathe life into you. Um, and I just feel like Belsmith afterwards was like, oh yeah? I can do that better. And, then and she did. Her... <laughs> she did get the more fun toy. I feel yeah. like players might appreciate these Panacea spirits better. Yes. Like, they're definitely useful. Like, they have like all the healing. They have some like divine damage, like the flame strike. Um, they, like, shoot rays out that disrupt undead. Right. So they're super helpful. Narrative-wise, as a DM, I would only have fun with this if it was literally Navi. Hey, listen, stop yelling that and heal me. Hey, hey. <laughs> totally fair. Totally <laughs> fair. All right. So speaking of lifting things from other sources... Where is it? Sorry, I'm trying to find the art here. Mm -hmm. We have the Sand Eagles. Now, 
This story may sound familiar to those of you who have read or seen Tolkien, like the, the Lord of the Rings books. These are huge outsiders, so they'd probably be celestials um, in the form of giant eagles. Mm -hmm. There are eight of them. Four were created by Corian. Four were created by Hadrada. Mm -hmm. They were made after the Titans War to help defend the people of Asherak against essentially the fallout, the, the right. remaining Titans, uh, Titan spawn that were wreaking havoc across the, the continent. Um, they speak all languages. <laughs> they are the eagles of, yeah. of Tolkien. Um, <laughs> when one dies, there's always eight. So when one dies, the, the lead, the most eldest eagle lays an egg and that, that one is reborn. Right. So in a way they're kind of like phoenixes, but mm -hmm. I mean they just they remind me so much of the the eagles from Lord of the Rings. It's it's almost painful. <laughs> then we have the sand serpents. These guys um I was debating on this because when I did my conversion for them, they were magical creatures right. in third edition, which isn't sorry, magical beasts, which isn't a thing in Fifth edition, they're either monstrosities or they're beasts, and yeah. most beasts don't have like an intelligence above, I want to say six. Uh, most can't speak. Most don't have any kind of magic. Winter wolves are the exception to that that I can think of off the top of my head. I think moon cats, which are a uh, scarred lands creature, also are are beasts, which means that like a druid right. can turn into them if they're of sufficient power. Um, so these sand serpents are not super intelligent. Uh, it says they were well adapted to thrive in the territory of the deserts of Badlands. It says that they're smarter than normal animals. Um, but going by the stats on here, it says intelligence of four. So I guess it depends on which animals. Right. Uh, they don't have a language, unlike winter wolves. But they are semi telepathic. Right. The the phrase sand serpents speak only via empathy mm -hmm. is an interesting way of putting it. Right. Like are they essentially like through a form of lesser telepathy, are they just, you know, expressing concern or elation or sadness right. you know so that's it's a they have a, a certain flavor to them that's kind of neat but it's it's a sand reptile <laughs> then we have the stealer of children which i think is awesome um i feel like this guy belongs in the um in the carnival crew for the shadow the carnival of shadows which are they have a bunch of them in the the various uh, creature collections. Mm -hmm. So this guy's a medium fae. And they tend to be dr dressed kind of like um, tricksters or jesters or, or uh, harlequins. And essentially they go around and it says they prey on children with a weak sense of self. Or sorry, and those of, with a weak sense of self. So it can be like an adult as well, but essentially people who haven't really come to know themselves, they don't have like right. a powerful ego, and they subvert these children. And over a course of time, so this is another one of those creatures, kind of like the Oculus Demon, where you, may, you might come into a town and people are just acting weird. Like yeah. kids are kids look like really tired all the time and maybe a little withdrawn and maybe they're doing some like things that kids normally wouldn't do. Um, I feel like over time it essentially makes them into sociopaths. Mm -hmm. And like then that. after about three weeks, they like physically begin to change into stealer of children. Like they, gotcha. it's how the, the species propagates. Right. Um, kind of like, like hags. Yeah. Like how they do the, they steal the, the kids. And, around, like, yeah. So I think they're a great plot point. They're definitely a, um, a lower level 
lower to like, like tier one, tier two in fifth edition, um, mm -hmm. depending on if you want your characters to fight this or, or just, just like, like find a way to write a uh, great, great plot point for a story. We have drought beetles. Um, these are also, these are vermin in third edition. They'd be beasts in fifth edition. Um, they are CR seven, however, so I can't think of a. I don't think druids get that high. I don't think you no. can turn into. So essentially, these things literally are so hot that they create fire that comes off of them, and they will go in and dehydrate. You know, like they'll climb into pools of water and remain burning, and so they boil off the water, and then all the fish and like the bugs that lived in the water and all of that, they'll just sit there and eat that. So. You know, townsfolk might come out into their, you know, like to go fishing or to get water from the, the pond or whatever. And all of a sudden it's just gone. Not all of a sudden, but like they wake up one morning, it's gone. And like there's just this infestation of these beetles chowing down on the dead fish. And they're, um, I wouldn't use them as just like a random, you're going to fight these beetles. Right. But absolutely like uh, you're, if you're. In a, if you're looking for that like desert oasis that's marked on your map and you get out there and these things are flying around, you're like, no, oh, kill the beetles before <laughs> they destroy the water. Then we have the godflies. These guys are great. I love these. <laughs> um, so they're also vermin, but they are vermin from elsewhere. It says that they're, they were thought to be um, outsiders or like uh, somehow came to this plane um, they're probably not native to this plane. Um, and they, they feed on, they feed on the corpses of fallen outsiders. So that, that descriptor meant celestials, fiends, aberrations, aberrations uh, gods, mm -hmm. titans, demigods. <laughs> so like, these things are pretty horrific for those those subtypes. Mm -hmm. As a human, you're just like, whatever. But what's interesting is they subvert um, divine energy. So if you have a church to Madriel or a church to Belsmith or whatever, or if you're even like a, a worshiper of, of a, a titan and you have a, a shrine to them, swarms of these things will come in and infest like the building and will essentially desecrate that. So if you had like a hollowed building, it's now an unhollowed building, um, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing. And then it worked. They have like, as a swarm, they have an anti-magic field against divine magic and they are immune to divine magic. So if your clerics over there trying to hit them with, um, guiding bolts or guiding bolt or uh, sacred flame. Mm -hmm. They're just, wasting their time <laughs> they'd be better to go pick up that hammer they never use <laughs> so i just thought they were uh again they're a great plot device but they're also like um i feel like in certain parties they would be a, a really great bane against certain you know if you have paladins yeah like a clear druid paladin right party they would have a heart uh, not a hard time, but they would be limited. So then, and if you've watched the series before, you know that the f teeth of Garak are the blame for a lot of things across the face of Skarn. The voracious fang swarm is another one of those, although it's just speculation on whether or not they were created from Gar uh, Garak's teeth or not. There, there are never less than 100 fangs excuse me that are in a swarm which i thought was just r completely random but also like so set you know what i mean they're right. just like there are exactly 100 fangs in a <laughs> swarm why that doesn't seem like a garak thing to do maybe he did maybe that's the highest he could count or the first number he came up with right who knows um When voracious, when voracious fang swarms surface, they hunt everything in the area to extinction. 
Mm-hmm. That has connected a lot of things to Garak because he is, you know, the the gluttonous titan right. that ate just thing. He just like walk across the face of Scarn and just shovel buildings into his mouth, right? Uh, although the wake of devastation left in the path of a voracious fang, fang swarm is impressive, it pales in comparison to the horror of the ghouls it leaves behind. So if you die from... Let's see if it's just... So, yeah, the energy drain attack that these things do. So if you're hit by one of them, they had negative levels back in the day, and now yeah. that's essentially converted to uh, max HP reduction. And so, essentially, if your max HP is reduced to zero, you die. Yeah. And then you come back as a ghoul. So, imagine, you know, uh, a small town or even a large, larger town or small city that one or two of these things comes flying through. Mm -hmm. Most of those creatures are just like commoners with like right. level one commoners. So a like couple one of hit, hit points, maybe 10 hit points. Yeah. So the number of ghouls created by these are terrible. So this is another great plot point device. You know, these things have gone through. And while they're terrible on their own, mm -hmm. the really horrid part is all of these people are now ghouls that are now going on to cause issues and create ghouls of their own. Yes. All right. Then we have another swarm, the wind demon. This thing is really weird. We were talking about it before. Yeah. Show. I like them, but they're just like so weird. <laughs> <laughs> so you see, they look like kind of a, an abstract demon, but it's all a swarm of these little floating specks. But those specks are actually very, very, very tiny sets of wings. <laughs> Where those wings come from, no one knows. Mm -hmm. And it is known that these things are essentially demonic essences. So imagine like um, when a demon dies and it, its soul gets, you know, its essence gets dragged back to whatever infernal or abyssal realm it came from and they like reforge it into another demon or whatever, like uh, depending on the, the source material, like and they might, might start as uh, the Muirs or right. what are the other ones? can't remember um yeah. so before that happens before they are reconstituted in that like lower form or even a higher form depending on what the the reconstitutor wants mm -hmm. would that be right um these things can be drawn to lathena who is trapped in some kind of abyssal plane yeah i think so and she forms them into these. So, like, where the wings come from, who knows, she but it's really given like... form. Right. It says here that, you know, she's pretty chill with hanging in her prison. Like, she she's not, like, railing against it like some of the other titans. Right. But there are those who are trying to, like, free her, like how Belsimith has... Or, sorry, um... Mormo. Mormo has entire cults that are like, we must free Mormo. <laughs> Lathena has some of that. Right. And she so, has just fans. Yeah. Yeah. Totally fan. Like a smaller fan base for sure. Yeah. The club, the club meetings are not nearly as often. And they don't sell out the stadium, but right. you know, they're, they're there. <laughs> and so when they do their rituals to try and summon Lathena you know, back to this plane, um, Oftentimes, these wind demons will get Sucked pulled back. Right, will get pulled back instead. And they're not under any kind of compulsion by those summoners. So they might just be like, hey, thanks for summoning me. It's good to be here. Uh, oh, I see you have donuts. Great. Or they might be like, why did you pull me away from Latina? And like go and eat their faces. So yeah. uh, they also have some spell like abilities. Some of them are. Um, either specific to the setting or they were old old school, like a prior edition spells, Power of the Thunder, uh, Touch, Touch of the, of the eel. eel. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Lightning, lightning Storm, yeah. 
I think this is Chaz's favorite. It is also one of my favorites. The Unholy Chorus. The Unholy Chorus. Now, it's unsure of what made these. Um, I like the theory that they are bards that died before, like, doing their their masterwork or something, right. you know. You must keep that song in your heart and in your right. head. Or your multiple heads in this case. Your multiple heads, yes. And so, over the course of time, these undead will take the heads of dead creatures, mm -hmm. not necessarily that they killed. Um, Just like something is dead. Right. And they animate that head. And so they're walking around carrying these animated heads that are constantly singing. Mm -hmm. And it's not like... It's not like listening to the ice cream truck come down the road and you're like, oh, the ice cream truck is here or like, you know, carolers and you know, right. during Christmas or something. This is like this haunting, dreadful song that causes discord and uh -huh. bad feels. <laughs> and so. Um, Sorry, I, I derailed myself there for a second. Um, I mean, my first thought of this is I would do like a high level Christmas, like Christmas one shot. Right? <laughs> and I would up level this so it's like slightly smarter. And so it can do like a caroling thing. Right. And everyone's like, oh my gosh, it's kind. Everyone comes out and then it's like, Heads! And then it suddenly switches. So they have that, like, draw in power. Um, makes it, like, slightly stealthier. Chaz, this Christmas, we are running that game on the Twitch stream. All right, done! <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Love it. That's awesome. <laughs> um, I think the other thing I was going to mention about them is... So it says that they have claws... I'm a little like how I mean they they might have claws but they are carrying like heads in each hand so like when do they get to use them their full attack are uh claws and heads or two heads or two claws so essentially the claw does where is this the claw does uh like slashing damage the head does bludgeoning damage I'm pretty sure um and for the claws are vorpal claws that is right not to be missed so if you if it if it uh crits on a foe it's gonna lop off parts yes which is amazing like it's so rare that you see a creature that isn't wielding a vorpal sword with a vorpal like ability a love it and the last creature we're going to talk about before we jump into the final creature we'll talk about <laughs> <laughs> is the Void White. Um, pretty much these things are, are normal white undead um, that are created by the spirit rot disease caused by the godfly. Right. So they're like a very specific subset of white um to create it was a it was a template so you'd place it on another creature what were you gonna say super rogy yes yeah, so the one that they the the template they show was a like a halfling rogue oh who turned into the white right gotcha. So, like, to create one, you just put the... On the next page, they have, like, creating a Void White. Um, that's the go. template so you like, put on it. So it has, like, an aura of despair. Plus three natural armor class. It also... So, essentially, the larva of the Godfly are active within it. Mm -hmm. And they're they're the power that's animating it. And so that that hunger for divine energy remains in the Void White. Gotcha. And so it, it pushes them to do what the Godflies are doing also. Um, but 
whereas a, a cleric might show up and be like, oh, it's undead. I turn you. Well, guess what? Can't they're turn immune because <laughs> they're immune to everything divine. <laughs> so that's pretty cool. Um, I, I, I think I appreciate these because they are um, a trick on your on your players they're that like oh obviously we're fighting a white i know the monster manual and so i know this is what it does mm -hmm. but do you do you really know what it does though right so yeah they're fun yeah and now i must find the other fellow who we're going to talk about and how a warlock might pack themselves to him where is he there he is all right, so Suvaros. I love Suvaros. <laughs> I am, like, so enchanted by the concept of this fellow. Where is his art? There you are. I spelled his name wrong on there, so he wasn't in the right place. <laughs> so back before gods. Mm -hmm. Um souls were reincarnated if they did anything uh, druids didn't have magic to call upon in the way that like a divine cleric does in order to restore people to life uh -huh. remember this is a previous edition I'm pretty sure now druids have um, revivify and stuff Fire like that something. I think so so that was not the case, at least prior to the gods showing up. Mm -hmm. Whether or not current day druids have that ability, I guess that's up to your DM. Like, can the titans instill that upon them? Or do they have to do like reincarnation, where you're right. essentially giving them a new life instead of their old one? Um,. And this woman named Ileana, uh, her lover was it was killed in a, a great battle. Um, and she essentially went mad from, from uh, sadness and desperation. And so she pulled on titanic magic that shouldn't have done what she wanted it to do. But through her, I, I feel like it's like through her sheer will, yes. she shoved this magic into... Suvaros's body and it did it worked it brought him back and at first she was just like oh my love welcome back I'm so glad to why are you grabbing my head ah! and then he tore her into pieces yeah as one does it's true it's true as one does and if you <laughs> if you look at the art of Suvaros um it can be a little misleading and we'll get into why but this image like he is built like the incredible hulk like he's huge and like even his fists are massive they might even be bigger than his head um and so he just easily like ripped her into pieces and it doesn't say whether or not she was the first that he did this to but he has this ability to essentially um tie and i don't mean physically but tie these severed heads mm -hmm. to himself um kind of like a tuning a magic item and the severed head begins like floating around him i like to think that the first head he did that to was iliana probably her um, yeah i feel like there is a certain level of like horridness that fits with the scarred land setting that that would absolutely be the case um and it grants him spellcasting abilities, even though he wasn't a spellcaster. And so as this... And by the way, part of what came back with him, I would say the larger part of what came back with him when he was resurrected, was something other. Mm -hmm. Probably a demonic essence of some powerful creature. Um, maybe an outsider, who knows for sure, but he is now considered, um, well, I guess in fifth edition, he was considered, sorry, third edition, he was considered a, an outsider. Now he would be a fiend. 
And he's one of those unique fiends, so, like, there aren't multiple Subaroses running around. And he's called right. Subaros the Undying Prince. Um, because if he dies, his spirit then goes elsewhere and enters another body. So that's why I was saying this this art may be, may be misleading. Um, I guess it depends on how you want him to appear, because does he reshape the new body into his old form? Mm-hmm. Or does he just take on that new form? Like, is this just, like, one big guy that he, like, took over, and then when this one died, he took over, like, a five-year-old child? Oh, right. then, like, oh that's horrifying. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> um... So yeah, so not only does he have these heads, uh, he can have up to three heads circling him at any time. Um, He usually has a bard, a sorcerer, and a druid. And so he has access to all of this magic. Um, And then his physical touch can inflict different things. In third edition, they're definitely different than what I did for my, my, uh, my conversion for him because a lot of this stuff doesn't exist anymore for the most part. Um, a lot of things don't do ability drain. So like you don't you lose uh, constitution score and stuff like that. It's just, I think in fifth edition they did it because it's a lot easier to not deal with that kind of stuff. Because when you lose con, you have retrograde loss of hit Life, points. Man, yeah. When you lose strength, it changes how you are hitting and the damage you're doing. When you lose like, dex. I don't think like two creatures, honestly that do like any kind of ability trait, like intellect of ours. And I think that's like a one time thing. And then shadows. Yeah. Shadows. Like actual strength. And that's like the one creature that can rethink of that really does that. Yeah. Like official creatures. Those are the only ones I can think of in Kobold presses books. There are some more, but yeah. those aren't like official D and D. So essentially he has a ghoul touch, a mummy touch, a shadow touch and a vampire touch. Um, for my conversion, I did uh, vampire touch is essentially vampiric touch the the spell so he oh, yeah. gains he gain or he does damage he does necrotic damage and then gains life back shadow touch was dealing uh, damage and then reducing max hit points uh-huh. um or no wait sorry ghoul touches that one right <laughs> um mummy touch does mummy rot on top of that and then shadow touch. In here, and I'll have to double check it, because maybe I did do... Because Shadows do have the, the ability drain. So I yeah. think I did leave that. I think I left that in my, my version. And in the old version, um, he did do the same thing, where he's doing 1d6 strength damage. And if he dies, if if you're reduced to zero, if your strength is reduced to zero, you die. And in this case, you come back as a shadow. So essentially, mm-hmm. he's like a conglomeration of all these different undead right. as a demon prince. Like there's a certain hearkening to Orcus as yes. as like a undead. demon prince of undeath. Yeah, I feel like he's almost the Orcus of Scarland. Scarn. Yeah, he's not quite as powerful. He's CR twenty four. I think Orcus. Well, old school Orcus was higher. I don't know what. Orcus now might be like twenty five. The book is over there, but I'm not gonna go get it. <laughs> oh, I have the book. You look that up while I I finish going over his stuff and then we'll talk about what would a warlock look like for this guy we're getting short on time but i think we can do it we don't need to build out everything um on top of that he can summon undead he has spells that create undead um he has access to druid bard and sorcerer spells uh there's like a spell like ability list but i feel like a dm can easily change that yeah when one of the heads, so like essentially if you do a certain amount of damage, uh, like a Hydra, uh, if you do a certain amount of da- damage in a single strike, it destroys one of the heads. If you destroy all the heads, he loses access to that magic, like to casting the magic. Um, but if he got a new head, he might learn new spells. It's really up to you as a DM on how you want to, how you want that to work. Um, yeah, so that's pretty ha- pretty much him as a uh, like his his uh his stats and everything um he was actually locked away by titans before the titan war because uh, he was created a long long time ago way back before the gods even existed 
and he went crazy upon his return. Oh, he has a death aura. That was the other thing. Um, so he has this aura that just kills things. So if you are in the aura and you fail your, at that time, fortitude saving throw, you died. At that time, it didn't matter what hit points you had or anything. You just died. If you made your save, you were immune for 24 hours. So in line with, with 5e, I changed that a little bit, um, where if you have under hit, 100 hit points, kind of like power word kill, yeah, you die if you fail to save. Um, otherwise, you get a, a level of exhaustion. If you make the save, you are immune for 24 hours. So this guy was walking across the face of Skarn and killing forests and towns because you know like most of the stuff around him is not going to make a dc 20 fort save (laughs) unless they rolled natural 20s um and so the titans locked him away in another dimension when the titans fell those bonds and and seals and things that uh, that they had done to affect the world the world not the earth um either weakened or shattered completely and the seal on his prison broke and so Suveros has returned to Skarn with a ravening vengeance he is so angry for being locked away and I feel like if the Titans were still here he'd be like come at me bros because I am pissed at you um but now he has like gods to contend with so he could be a really great end game save the world kind of Right. But there's also the people who are absolutely going to sell their souls for a bit of his magic, for the uh-huh. bit of abilities he can do. So, uh-huh. if you were a warlock, Chaz, as I know you are, <laughs> and you were going to give your service to Suveros, what do you think? Uh, I need to open the player's handbook while we talk about this so I can look at the. Um, how packs are made Uh but what i know so like i know when you make your pact you get access to different spells what's your take on that first level one you make a pact with him what do you get first feature um so most uh warlock packs are very much like the family so like pact of the fiend pact of the arch fae um Whereas, like, making a pact with, like, a singular entity is a little differently. So then I look at what, like, is specifically Suveros. And Suveros has, like, three things. Suveros has Death Ward, Death uh, Aura. Suveros has this, like, creation of undead. Because I think that's, like, part of the thing with him, right? Is, like, you, if you kill all the people and make them undead, you become the king of the world. And he's like, that is aces. Right. Um, so it's a lot of this creation of undead. Um, and then I don't even consider the druidic, the altar magic to be his. It's more of this like control of other magics. And so that's right. what I expect for like a, uh, a warlocky thing. So like my first thing, the first feature, like that number one, that like key warlock feature to me would be a highly toned down, death or like maybe does isn't it even about like killing people but it's more like you know maybe has one of the effects of his touch so like maybe you have like a i won't say 20 foot aura of not mummy rod not shadow like the vampiric and br- vampiric or the other one like ghoul touch that actually seems fitting Actually, my, the, I like the vampire one. So, like, if he had an aura and if he were to hit, so it wouldn't necessarily need to be someone he hit physically because it's an aura. But, like, if he cast Eldritch Blast on someone with so an aura, is, he would get temporary hit points, maybe? I like that. Now, the, the, the key thing is, and because you know I love Warlocks. Um, right. You know my most hated spell of all time is Eldritch, Eldritch Blast. Blast. Right. I, hate it so much i understand why it's there um but to me it really takes away what i love about the warlock and so like whenever i make classes for the warlock i've made so many at this point just like what's around with i'm always like how i have to be aware of how does eldritch blast work in context with these features because it like right. very much like, alters it um so 
and like so with this it's a, it's a super simple um like fix you know what is the radius of this thing like 20 is a nice radius because it's like yeah far enough if you want to be a ranged warlock like you're close but like 20 is not technically not that far like almost anything can like get to 20 feet get through 20 feet without like having to expend a dash right um, so that's a nice um and it might be interesting if you like had an invocation that you could take, like make a specific invocation for this pact where it maybe extends your aura and bolsters its abilities, you know, like make it worth taking an invocation to do. But we'd have to kind of see what what does the aura do over time right. that could improve that. So just something to keep in mind as we go. Yeah, because um, one of the things that I think the aura should do is some sort of interaction with that like on like the creation of undead like if you die within the aura um so oh, i know like hex nice. have uh you kill a thing you can use a action or a bonus action to summon a shade or something yeah uh, something similar to that like yeah you can create these like super weak little like undead just, like maybe like the like mummy hands like cinder you could create a small army or maybe oh, maybe a swarm because that's beautiful <laughs> I, I do. I, I love that. Um, okay, so like, for example, uh, and I like the idea that maybe this grows over time and you can choose which yeah. effect you want it to do, but like the aura is like the basis of of this pact. And right. when you start off, if you, maybe not someone else, but if you kill someone within that aura yes. with some ability, you can use your bonus action to create some kind of undead. And Crawling Claws are so rarely used yeah. And just to imagine somebody's hands ripping themselves off. <laughs> right? Like, I love yeah. that. That is yeah. freaking beautiful. Or they're, or we could come up with like a, a re-statted crawling claw that is their head instead. Because yeah. Subros and his floating heads were essentially the like head floats up and has some re revised version of a crawling claw. Yes. To keep it like down on, on CR. Mm -hmm. um, and so then that it brings you close to the super without like being super overpowered which i'm like great um something that i do think there should be druid um spells just because like the addition of extra spells just like really helps like add flavor mm -hmm. um druid spells would make sense because that was like the first her the first head even though it's not his like he at this point he probably knows how to cast it Right, yeah, and that's the thing is in his description, it doesn't state that he loses the spells. He loses the ability to cast the spells if he all of the heads it. are gone and then right. regains them as soon as he has at least one head replaced. So it makes me feel like he has constant access to those spells at this point. And he just has to, like, get a head to, like, cast, yeah. Right. Um, so just, like, you know, some Druid spells, like heat metal. yeah. Just, yeah. My gut reaction, and I know it's more complicated than maybe it needs to be, and sometimes I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. In doing the, we would call it like the Undying Prince expanded spells. So at first level, you have that expanded spell list and have three separate options. So you have your druid, your sorcerer, and your bard. Right. And you choose one after a long rest. Which makes it complicated because then you have to be like, I have access to this list of spells today. But it also lets you plan ahead to be like, I know I'm going to need Revivify. <laughs> or I want to have access to Revivify. Or Heat Metal. Or I really, really want to have access to um, uh, Vicious Mockery or, or uh, Dissonant Whispers. You right. know, without just being like, you have access to all of these spells. Oh yeah, no, like definitely would not be all of that like one of the things i like about the warlock is ironically like the, the limited choice yeah um, and like more importantly like that limited choice of like even if you had because i think like they learn like a decent amount of spells they have a pretty big spell list um but even then like you know you only can cast like those two spells a day so like i've never taken counter spell as a warlock because right it's expensive that's, like that's a big ask for someone who can only cast two, whereas a sorcerer has like twenty thousand spells. I'm like, yeah, you can, you can cast it, right? Um, what I, I'm, 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 I'm mulling over now. This.
it, having this e extra pool of spells that you can take rather than having the traditional like you have like these two spells you can learn at level one and these two spells you can learn at level two right um essentially have a second feature um rather than expand a spell list because oh. I'm too, I'm so like proud of it that like packed magic you have these things you know them um having an ex extra feature of like you can like you have been granted access to these spells so these spells like you just know um you can cast one of these spells you 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 decide on two or something like that and then you can cast one of these spells for free um at level 1 and then like as you level up you can he says, like, add multiple heads so you can cast more. Um, that way, it very much separates it from that packed magic, which is different enough that it is annoying. Yeah. Like, mixing. Like, even <laughs> when I, like, multi-class, like, Warlock and Sorcerer, like, I, I have to treat them as different spells. Because you can't, you can't, you, do, you don't download, down level spells. Yeah. At, yeah. So that's, that's where I'm, but I do like that idea of, like, here's this other spells like you can pick so like i want revivify and i want uh dissonant whispers and i don't know which one i'll use but i have that so it actually gives you more access to spells while you still have your traditional warlock death spells yeah or what have you. so then you get to sixth level and i had this idea and i don't know if it fits i don't know if it fits this guy and I, it's it's really because he has these these heads that are around him he has access to druid and, and bard and sorcerer spells and each of those classes has more spell slots per day than a yes. warlock does and so it's kind of where I was coming from with this and maybe it's not the right flavor but I was thinking about if and going back to the aura tying it in with that uh -huh. if you kill a creature within your aura um, and this would be a once a day thing so kind of like I don't know if all of the sixth level ones, I know Misty Escape one is, Dark One's Own Luck is, but essentially once per day, if you use this, you can't use it until after a... Long rest. Long rest, or maybe a short rest, because it says short or long rest. This one might yeah, be yeah. a little more. Um, but essentially, like, you kill that person, and you can then expend this ability to gain a spell slot. Not even like if you've expended yours, you're not regaining one, but you you're gain good. one until you take a short or long rest. It's essentially feeding that ability to do magic because that's kind of what happened with his heads. It feeds his ability to do magic. Does that make sense? So I like that, which probably makes it dangerous because like the most valuable thing for a warlock is that extra spell spell level. Right. Um, like, I literally don't even... Tr so, so one of the most useful things I heard when I was creating Warlocks is, like, Warlocks don't have spells. They have spell-like features. Um, and so if you treat haste like a spell, then you're in trouble. But if you treat it like, oh, like, once a day, I can't go faster. Um, it's different. So I, like, do like that idea. Um, it does run the risk of being super valuable. true <laughs> not a bad idea though uh, let, let me let me say that like, i do not think it is a bad idea but it, it is super strong and i do i mean so like uh, looking at the other packs they're all on short or long rests and maybe making this one an exception to having it be only on long rest because if you did it on a short rest you could do it a lot you know yeah like if you did it on a short rest it, it wouldn't work because then right. it's like i'm gonna kill a bunny oh, everyone now I have spell right and maybe you have to limit i don't know i, I wouldn't get well, too actually, crunchy on harris, it but like harris harris i think what what would like switch it up for me um does the with the aura mm -hmm. actually yeah um i'm assuming the aura is constantly on i would say you can turn it off because once you get into higher if it's actually doing damage on its own and that's where the question That'd was. Be like, bad. You know, that you could be like, <laughs> I'm gonna turn this on for like a minute or ten minutes. Y'all stay away from me, right. or something that just, like, just emanates from. Because if something you have to turn on, 
then yeah, because then like it's like a risk. Um, if you don't kill anything, then like you miss, you lose that opportunity. Um, that to me is easy work, doable. But yeah, I don't, either way, I like that idea of the taking of regaining of the spell slot. You could, um, you could weaken it by saying, uh, once per day, maybe it's not even, the other thing is like, you have to kill someone like you, like a lot of the things like the, the one that you raise, you know, raise the shade with, or where you get temporary hit points for killing the creature. Something that has it's to reliant die. on you. Killing, yeah. Right. So that really does limit how often that's going to happen. If you wanted it to limit it even more, or remove the if you if it was just a creature dies within your aura, uh-huh. um, and you weren't the one who had to kill it, you could say that creature has to be a spellcaster with available spell slots, and you're essentially stealing the magic from them. Right. It might be a little too crunchy and complicated. That's yeah. a lot to pay attention to, but just a thought throwing out yeah. there. Yeah, no, like, I think, like, mechanically, it is scary, but, like, not (laughs) untenable scary. But, no, like, I like that idea. It is this, like, fitting of I am taking the magic for me, um, or I am using your magic for my own. How would you feel about having it be used for that other level one feature? So it's not getting another pack a spell slot but another use of the bard sorcerer or like druid. those specific spells yes that makes sense yeah so you can't do multiple hungers of hadar which is what i would do <laughs> right but you can't use it specifically for these other magics that you have access to but you can't you you don't really have access you just know them and you need this other manifestation to cast them yeah that scares me much less for some reason. I don't know why. I have this idea for the... Uh, it doesn't fit this, and so I would never use it, but like having a warlock that has an aura, if we could ever figure out what that like patron would be, but essentially you control your magic within the aura better. So like if you hunger of Hadard over there, you can also do... like Essentially, you're splitting it, so it would be twinning the spell, but you take half of the Hunger Hadar and you put it over oh, there instead. That kind of stuff. Would, it could be an invocation, actually. Like, oh, yeah. It's, it's something you're having to spend a, you know, a choice to get. Yeah. Um, but anyway. Okay, so level 10. Mm-hmm. Uh, for the Fiend, that's Fiendish Resilience. You're getting... A, you choose a damage type when you take a short long rest and you gain resistance to that type um fey is beguiling presence you... lots of, like defensive stuff here hexblade yeah. is you have that um roll a d6 and attack that hits you just doesn't hit you um yeah an old great old one is your thought shield where you can't be scried on uh or you, yeah. people can't read your mind like it's they're they're not super powerful abilities they're and like you said they're definitely defensive yes uh for this one um feels very much like because i know the the undead warlock which i am playing in two campaigns right now because it's so good and i know it's the agon, the agonizing blast that ruined it i just know it um is much more of like a when you die thing. I think that actually fits pretty strongly here in that like when he dies, he just like finds another body. Right. Um, and so I'm trying to figure like if you could do something like when you reach zero hit points, you can. Oh, like a skeleton, you could do a, a fortitude saving throw to stay up at one hit point. I was thinking more like you could, if you have a clawing hand about um you can choose to inhabit that hand and do and like essentially like grow from that hand so like you die and then you like come back to life so you're saying like if you actually died not like when you hit zero and we're making death saves (laughs) 
I think it makes more sense when you die. I think it's more fun when you drop to zero. <laughs> That's true. Like maybe if you drop to zero while your your R is activated, you you yes. just die. Like you don't make death saves. Yeah, like you don't control this magic. It wants everyone to be undead. You're right. included. Um, so if your ores activate and you die, but you have a clawing thing around, you can just like transport your body into that one. It takes you six seconds and you are full life. Interesting. It seems a little more powerful than the other level 10 stuff, but I, I'm absolutely willing to leave it on the table. I, so like, I'm, I'm thinking about that too. Um, well, let's we'll have a D8, so that's not that much life. Um, depending on like, the time you, level, you get it. It is slightly more powerful, um, and I think it could be easily adjusted by like how much life you gain back. Um, but especially if it's you have that downside of like if you drop to zero hit points when your thing is thing, you just die. Um, that is a a nice way to one incentivize the loss of your own life. Um, once again, I'm going to reference the undead warlock. They actually have a lot of thing like. They're a great melee combatant, not because they have good defense. Like, I have decent AC because I took, like, two feats in order to get medium armor expert and then heavy armor expert. But, like, they have a lot of, like, temporary hit points um, at level 10. Like, when you die, you ex or when you drop to zero hit points, you explode and you come back to life. Um, it's a lot of, like, hit me. That's fine. Like, I right. have contingency plans for dying, which I think fits with this guy. Uh, but Suvaros, like, when he dies, he's like, that's great. I'm going to just take that body over there, though. Right. So, so we could, like, just, find a way to, like, tone that down. Just my, like, gut reaction to, like, reduce that, like, mm -hmm. almost not quite immortality and not quite, like. Oh, well, once every like, week. Should I show you yeah. Yeah. You could definitely limit the, num the number of uses and how often it can be done. But, um,. Like part of me just wants to to like scale it back to you. Your spirit goes to that other thing, but doesn't. Um, you don't like regrow out of it, and your body is still like alive and making death saves. But essentially, you get to continue as that thing. And if you can speak, you can cast spells. So like if you took over the body the body of a zombie, you'd be able to cast spells. Um, but if you took over the body of a crawling claw, you wouldn't be able to. But, like, you essentially wouldn't be unconscious. So you, one, as a player, removes you from having to sit there and be like... Just, like, waiting. And this turn I make my death save. Neat. Right. Uh, essentially, you're controlling something else without that, like, sense of power that seems just higher than the other packs are. Mm -hmm. So then... I don't know. I would... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. So if we limit it to like the floating heads, which are like the reskin, like crawling things. Oh yeah. Um, so then you have to have one of those um, floating head. So you can't it, you can speak. Um, anything with a somatic component, you can't do. Um, and then over if you survive that battle, like over the night, you like grow a body, but then you have to regain your your little crawling claws thing. Yeah. It might be interesting, um, just kind of like some synergy with it. So your death aura moves with you. Yes, I like that. And your body has advantage on death saves as long as it's within the aura. So mm -hmm. it means your that floating head or whatever still needs to stay around the body. Right. If if you want to have advantage, and maybe you have yeah. disadvantage if it's not because your your spirit isn't in it. It's gone. Yeah. So it's just kind of like lying there. Right, so that like gives you a lot of incentive to stay by your body, yeah. um, and if you die, I feel like at that level, if you die, you die. Like if somebody runs over and smooshes the head, or whatever. Yeah. I do like. Then it like doesn't like. Things. What's that? I, I do like limit to like only like once per week or once every D four day or something. So like if you if you die again, like you don't have the ability to like transition again. Like you're not right. you're not super gross. Um. I also like the idea, and maybe this is an invocation as well, but um, because he is so in death focused, um, undead under your control, because Subaros has both animate dead and create dead. Uh -huh. um, so undead under your control. 
excuse me, in the aura might be um, either have advantage, they have turn resistance, so advantage on being turned, or they might be immune to being turned. Uh-huh. Um, because there's nothing worse than having your undead exploded by a fucking cleric. <laughs> <laughs> or for your undead to run off. <laughs> um, that just that was just something that crossed my mind. Oh. I'm not sure like where to work that in if it's it on the, it was on the defense side of things, but it seems maybe a little too weak because it's very I specific. Level one. Yeah, that could work out. Yeah, like you have the thing, and then if you have undead hair, it has turn resistance because, like I say, it's super specific. You would have to be fighting a cleric. Right. That is turn. Paladin, right? Or Paladin, yeah. And like Paladins aren't going to turn, they're going to smite. And clerics could turn, but they could also be like, I'm going to summon this. Uh, whatever cleric spells I just don't remember right now. But yeah, right. so like that could be, I think, incorporated into like a level one, one thing. So then you got level 14. And this is where it's okay. like things really all, go yeah. weird. All the, all the stuff like hurl you through hell, where you're literally hurled through hell. Right. Um, that one where you're just like lost in a maze of fey stuff. Uh, yeah, Dark Delirium. Yeah. Hexblades where, oh my god, just like it turns a Hexblade into like a machine that kills things because you can transition your Hexblade's courage from creature to creature now. Uh, and the, the great old one, Create Thrall, is just so crazy compared to the others. I yeah. mean, they're all crazy in their own lo- in their own right, but essentially you're just like, I'm going to turn you into my mindless drone. Mm-hmm. Um, <sighs> yeah, that's a... I always have a hard time with this level because it's like you can easily go overpowered and it's really easy to go underpowered. Um, they have such different flavor, like... This one is like Hurl Through Hell is very combat oriented. To create thrall, not at all. Right. <laughs> um, I mean, I think we should. Or well, my first thought is revisiting the Death Ore, right? Mm-hmm. Like, you had Death Ore for a while. It's been like a key to your whole thing. And like, maybe that's the reason why we shouldn't. But like, maybe we could make this more of a Death Ore. Like, yeah. all living creatures within the Death Ore take some some da- necrotic damage right right um if a creature dies in it it is automatically raised as a head until you have three um at 14th level um you know a d4 is like too low but you, you could say like a d8 or like a d10 you could you say like a d12 um most things will like like little like bunnies will die blah 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 blah. Um, one, it's a good way to like gain these like quick heads, um, if you're willing to like, you know, drop into a tavern and drop some people, um, which is <laughs> fitting for what he Suvaros wants. Like, yeah, right. make me more undead so I can have friends because that's what I'm supposed to do. Um, it is just like extra like constant damage in like a fight. If you're willing to be that closer, maybe you could expand the range at this point. You know, right? Um, the thing is, like, like you I say, feel like, like you could take a, you could do an invocation that would essentially give you the, uh, the uh, careful spell, meta magic, so you can be like, I'm designating these people to not be affected by my aura, right. but I wouldn't build it into it automatically. I wouldn't. Yeah, no, wouldn't... like you gotta like invest into that, right? One. Well, and like Suros don't give a shit about your. Yeah, Suvros wants everyone pal. to be undead right? you, so he's not going to have you do it. Right. I like that. Well, but it makes you closer to your homeboy, Suvros. Um, right. Now, like you say, like that could be um, underpowered. Um, still requires like looking you to, at... Like... Sorry, go ahead. Like, it, it still re... well, unless you like make the death... Or as big, it still requires you to be like super close. Um, an extra, even if you make it a D12, extra D12 necrotic damage a turn. It's kind of boring. Um, really, it comes with the ability to like quickly gain heads is the, the big thing, but you know. 
and of course all three so in the in the main player's handbook uh dark delirium you can you get it again after a short or long rest hurl through hell is a long rest and create thrall is until you like that thrall is is charmed by you until you use it again but it doesn't give a how often can you use this kind of thing so you have like some pretty variant big variances on the floor of 14 power i would probably do um this ability that you have for nuking people with your aura probably only lasts for so long maybe it's a minute yeah and you have to do a long rest to do it again and like hurl through hell does 10 d10 psychic so you probably have to really tone back that power because if you're doing a uh you know 15 or 20 foot sphere around you that's potentially a lot of damage you're pumping out right to many creatures so um on the one hand you may not be killing them because at that level yeah things are going to have a lot more power so it is a thing where you're just like i'm gonna walk into the tavern and get some new heads (laughs) and then your party has to be like okay we're just gonna or, turn or kill this you. way, <laughs> right? So we got the uh, in Tasha's mm-hmm. that plunge. You can magically le- open temporary conduits to watery destinations. As an action, you can teleport yourself and fight with a creature that you can see. Uh, amid a world of tentacles, you all vanish and reappear. So this was a, a teleportation spell at level huh. fourteen. Um, and then the genie, um, limited wish. You entreat your patron to grant you a small wish as an action. Talk to your genie, requesting the effect of one spell that is sixth level or lower. The spell can be from any class list, and you don't need. Yeah, so you know, limited wish and a group teleport. Those are essentially like toned down like, spells. Like I think the yeah. teleport each one is like just a scatter, but like watery scatter. <laughs> right. Yeah, I like the idea of the uh, of you being able to imbue the the aura with damaging effects. Um, and then like the automatic altering of, of anyone who dies in it to your, Mm. your floating head minion. Yeah, that's a cool touch. Let me see if there's any fun things with Subaros that we missed. I don't think so. Summon undead. I would totally build invocations for it too that allowed you to use his different touches yeah. on a toned down scale. Like if you do a, uh, maybe they have to be unarmed. But Honestly, like, like, I would, I would like the 14th one to have like a part like shadow touch thing rather than like damage. But that just is once again, like we say, 5e is not very conducive to that, especially on that scale. Right. Um, I mean, doing strength damage uh, on so Suvros does more strength damage than a shatter does. So like, skull like redoing it according to how the, the shatter does, right? Um, as opposed to the the CR twenty four, um, that would probably make sense, especially because you're doing it to multiple creatures. That might be mm-hmm. interesting. Um, it would definitely off creatures a lot faster because I mean statistically speaking you're gonna remove its strength faster than you're gonna remove its hit points right but you might roll ones every time so (laughs) ooh hold on let's put a pin in that a secondary idea um one of the scariest things about Suvaros which we did not talk about is its ability to summon undead so we can summon five mummies right uh, three more, which I don't know, four specters, or one vampire wizard or one lich wizard. Um, yeah. Another so, option. Mm-hmm. I need to look up, because you do get um, create undead. He, he gets create undead. Is, so like let me see what that i don't remember what that does exactly because it's different than animate right 
keep talking while I'm looking this up. Oh, yeah. Uh, we have ways to like built in to create like little mini undeads. Uh, perhaps this is a way to um, control yeah. a more power. Huh? That's the one that is ghouls. Ah, yeah. Perhaps this is a way to control a more powerful undead, either as a thrall. Uh, while I do hate summons, it does fit in with the um, the class. Right. Or to have a Final Fantasy esque summon. You know, you have a you know control of a vampire for like five rounds or something. Right. Um, it also might make an interesting. Invocation. Invocation. Um, just because it is... You could build it off of a spell that you already have, so your invocation allows you to create more powerful undead for a short burst. Mm-hmm. Like, the vampire that you create doesn't, like, remain a vampire after it's over. Right. Because, like, Suvaros's summoning only lasts for a minute, so maybe you're like, okay, I make this corpse into a vampire, and it comes up and is, like, a CR, what, 14 or whatever vampire um, for a minute. Yeah. Which cool. is way better than three ghouls. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, warlocks are one of those really tricky classes because they have so much ability to have different flavor because of invocations invocations um but also like there's the the pack like like patch of the chain pack of the blade right like they're made to to me they are the most customizable class in the way you because like wizards are super customizable in that they have all but like they are a spell caster like that's right what they are you can try to make them like non-spell caster right? like that's what my um what my cat was, was supposed to be but like he still had like a crap ton of spells because that's yeah. what wizards do. Whereas, um, you know, days will go by where I just don't cast any spells on one of my warlocks because like you know it's packed to the blade, it's elder smites. Um, maybe I'll cast a defensive spell once in a while, but like warlocks are super like customizable, right? Which they kind of yeah. have to be because they are so limited. Also, like you really need to have like those abilities to throw on top of them, otherwise they're cantrip casters and i uh, and you know i could talk forever but like right. without eldritch blast like wallace are so much better like eldritch blast is needed because they are so easy to mess up right and if, so you but like i fully believe that like like you know yesterday we, when we played like i did like 70 something damage and granted we're like level eight or something but like you know, like warlocks are like can be super highly damaging. They can be super tanky. Like yeah, be, yeah. Especially you once to... you feet into like uh, like a hexblade with with heavy heavy armor, that's freaking amazing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, because yeah, like I had. I'm trying to remember what happened. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Either way, um, yeah, warlocks are super flexible. Um, and so I love making warlocks because of like all the like ways you can pop around like oh let's add some implications here let's put this here let's put this here how do we want to make this warlock what options do we want to be allowed to have this warlock um but i am always wary of eldritch blast which is to me like the most defining thing because if you take pack to the blade that doesn't change much take pack the chain it doesn't change much um taking any one specific invocation doesn't change much taking eldritch blast changes or relying on Eldritch Blast changes. Relying, yeah. Yeah, it definitely makes the difference between you being that guy who just stands in the back and goes, pew. Right. Pew. Pew. And, like, mechanically, if you have it, you should, because it's, especially if you, like, take Agonizing Blast and right. some other invocation about it. Like, one, like, all your invocations are towards that, but two, like, it is a solid choice where it does, like, you know, about as much damage as a fighter can do with the same amount of tar- yeah yeah well we've gone way over and <laughs> I'll be honest I don't feel bad about that <laughs> uh, I hope if you're watching and you're listening watching or listening hopefully both at the same time um, 
that you've enjoyed it and and got some fun out of the the creatures that are roaming around on Asherak and the. Uh, it's funny because like a lot of the creatures in the Asherak section of Strange Lands aren't specific to to Asherak. Like the glass scorpions are, um, but like for example, Suvaros here is not. He, right. I feel like the reason he's in that book was because that was their last book, and they took all of their remaining stuff and smooshed it into it, uh-huh. right? And maybe he was reborn as Suvaros, the Undying Prince, on Asherak, but. He can go anywhere now. He's he's a free agent, so uh, yeah, it's a it's a really fun book and it has so much stuff that can cover not just the continents that are in it, but Gelsbad and Termata, and you can have a lot of these things anywhere. So um, if any of those creatures sound fun, either pick up the Strange Lands PDF that's over on Drive Through RPG, or keep your eye out for a certain up. Dated to fifth edition thing that might be coming out soon. Uh-huh. Not saying that's what's happening, but I'm not saying it's not what's happening. So, with that in mind, uh, Chaz, is there anything you want to tell everyone before we head out? Uh, no, uh, but just thank you for having me. This was a blast. Uh, yeah, thanks for being about, on. Love talking about warlocks, love talking about. Uh, these creatures and how they can be used as like DMs to like mess with people, how like they're fun as a player to like just run into, like, oh, I'm gonna cast my like very divine druid spells and now that's gone. Like, this oh, is no. why I play DD for all these like unexpected, fun little things. So, totally. Yeah. And you were the first person I thought of when I read Subaros, and I'm just like, wait, this guy needs a freaking pact. <gasps> I gotta call Chaz. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm Jeremy Hochalter. You can find me here on Twitch at WH Publications, uh, over on Facebook at the same WH Publications, but on Twitter, of course, I've changed it. It is WH Pubs. Uh, this Saturday, Chaz is going to be on my stream over on the Onyx Paths Twitch channel, which is the Onyx Path, as we run through the jump start for Cavaliers of Mars, and it's called Festival of Blades, I believe. We'll go with yes. Uh, yes. That is at 2 p.m. Eastern. I am pretty darn sure. You can go over and check out their schedule if you want to double check that, but I'm pretty sure it's 2 p.m. Eastern. Um, it should be a hoot. Otherwise, what else do we have going on? Monday, we're playing through the Vampire the Ma- or Vampire the Requiem jumpstart on Travis's channel, which is Plastic Age Plays. That uh-huh. is at... Uh, what time is that at, Chaz? Five. That's also 2 p.m. Eastern. 2 p.m.? Okay, 2 p.m. Eastern. <laughs> time zones and all the fun. Mm-hmm. And then next week, I'll be back uh, to talk some more about the Scarred Lands and the lore thereof. So until next time, everybody stay safe, take care of yourself and of each other, and we will see you then. Bye. Bye.